can turn the dark into light You can take a soul that was lost and turn it around Lord, on my own My heart can turn as hard as a stone You can make it tender again With your love Stir up a hunger Stir up a hunger in my heart Nothing will satisfy me Nothing else will do Stir up a hunger A hunger in my heart Stir up a hunger in my heart Take a dark into light You can take a soul that was lost Turn it around Oh Lord, on my own My heart can turn as hard as a stone But you can make it tender again With your love Nothing else will do Stir up a hunger a Hunger in my heart Stir up a hunger in my heart Stir up a hunger, stir up a hunger in my heart. Nothing will satisfy me, nothing else will do. Stir up a hunger, a hunger in my heart. Stir up a hunger in my heart. Good morning. Good, morning. Good, morning. Good morning, and the Lord be with you. I want to welcome you to worship, invite you to sign in on our website or use your phone to scan our QR code and it'll take you to that spot that you can let us know you're worshiping with us today. We welcome everyone in person and online. But today, uh, we want to thank everyone who has participated in the Operation Christmas Child Shoe Boxes. We're going to have a blessing for that during the uh, children's sermon time. And uh, we are still collecting gifts for Toys for Tots uh, in the collection box that's down by the uh, double doors going out to the main parking lot. Christmas poinsettia orders are due today. Uh, we have more bright pink order forms in the narthex and gathering room. And as a last resort, if you uh, didn't bring a checkbook today, just at least please the, uh, uh, call the church office in the morning and uh, we'll fill out a form for you and you can send your check in uh, sometime later. 
Council members are invited to pick up their council packets in the, in the chapel as you leave worship today. And we have in the gathering room DVD movies to share. Um, and uh, uh, periodically people borrow them. We ask they bring them back uh, so more can share them. Uh, we just added this week uh, the Jesus Revolution to that uh, pile of DVDs. And some of you might enjoy uh, looking at that. Uh, the, uh, uh, or if you have some faith movies uh, to share, uh, please bring them. I noticed this week that over the last four years, and I won't go into the reasons how I noticed that, but I did, that we've had 41 members pass away, a significant percentage of our membership. And during the same period of time, everyone suffered from the impact of separation uh, necessitated by COVID restrictions. Uh, so I got the feeling we probably just need time to spend together. Uh, and so uh, beginning the week after Thanksgiving next week, um, I thought I'd like to invite you to join me for a, an hour of coffee and conversation on Wednesday mornings at 10 o'clock. We'll have group conversation or break into little groups, uh, talking with your friends, but just let's do it together uh, in the church, in the gathering room, where it'll be simple to do. Uh, there'll be another note in the newsletter going out about that, but we're going to start in about a week and a half, not t the day before Thanksgiving. And speaking about Thanksgiving, we remember that Mike Summers is marching, and he's not here today. He's already flown out. Um, he's marching in the 400, with 400 band directors from around the country as an honor uh, at the uh, Macy's Day a Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Uh, they will be up uh, early in the program, and the program starts, the coverage starts at 8.30 in the morning. I believe it'll be on channel 27. And uh, uh, they are the fourth group up, the second band. I think the first band is Alabama A&M, then the NYPD group will be coming through, then the Radio City Music Hall Rockettes, and then, then uh, the uh, uh, band director's national band will be coming up. I'm told that Snoopy will be near them. So let's support Mike and uh, uh, watch on Thursday morning, and then happy Thanksgiving to everyone this week. Those are all the announcements I have for our call to worship. Today we are in the third week of Jesus' fifth great teaching in the Gospel of Matthew, which is about the second coming, the final judgment, and how we ought to live. Jesus spends three quarters of his teachings on the implications of his second coming. In week one, two weeks ago, he shared the signs of his coming. Last week, he led us to think about um, the impact on our thinking as we prepare for his return, and this week, the impact on our actions. I remember a movie from uh, this week as I was thinking about this, these scriptures. I remembered a movie from the year 2000 uh, that starred, among others, Jim Caviezel. And the movie was called Frequency, where Jim's character, a New York City police detective, was able, and I won't explain anything, to go back in communication with his father from 30 years earlier, talking on a ham radio. And his father was a New York City firefighter who had died uh, in a fire just a few days after that conversation. And so it's a story of how he might think about trying to save his father's life uh, in that 30-year span of conversation. Really a, a fun, interesting movie. The question I thought of for us today, if you knew what was going to happen in the future, like Jim's character knew about his father, if you knew what was going to happen in the future, what would you do? We begin our service today with our brief order of confession and forgiveness. Please rise. We gather in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, 
that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In 1 John chapter 1, God's word says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And together we pray, most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his only Son to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what the Lord has prepared. But by His Spirit, He has revealed His plan to those who love Him. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what the Lord has prepared. But by His Spirit, He has revealed His plan to those who With loving kindness by his hand We have hope for the future yet to come In time we'll understand The mystery of his plan No eye has seen No ear has heard Mind has conceived what the Lord has prepared, but by His Spirit He has revealed His plan to those who love Him. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived. The Lord has prepared, but by His Spirit He has revealed His plan to those who love of Him. Gracious God, in baptism, you pour out upon us gifts of immeasurable, eternal worth, faith, salvation, and the calling to serve as your witnesses in the world. Help us to deepen our baptismal life, walking wet daily, 
and responding with abandon to your gracious gifts through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace. To love you from the inside out, everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond. The cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the inside out, Lord, my soul cries out from the inside out, Lord, my soul cries Today's first lesson is taken from 1 Thessalonians. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night of the darkness, 
So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for today's gospel from Matthew 25. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten young women took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with, the, with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those young women got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the other young women came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. And he who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he who also had the two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours, but his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you know that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who is not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. I invite the children to come forward at this time. And I think they're going to help wheel some carts in, maybe.
Good morning. Well, thanks for coming today. <clears throat> and thanks for helping wheel up the Operation Christmas child shoeboxes. Um, I have a box here I've borrowed to use for today. And people have filled these boxes with a variety of gifts for children. Um, and uh, each item is meant to uh, help a person know they're loved. Um, each item in there is probably going to help them grow in some way, either helping them do schoolwork or drawing or grow physically if they're like playing with a soccer ball. I think this, this box might have a soccer ball in it. So it has, oh, it has several things. I'm not going to probably get it packed in again. But it has a, a pump to blow up the soccer ball has the soccer ball deflated so it'll fit in the box, has a cap for someone, oh, and glasses <laughs> that I didn't break, thank the Lord. So uh, it's got all sorts of fun stuff in there uh, for kids to let them know, and a whole bunch of other things in there. There's, so this is going to help a person grow physically as they play soccer. But there's a water bottle in here, let me see, and... Uh, Inside the water bottle are a bunch of mechanical pencils. So they can use the water bottle going to school. Do you guys take water bottles to school? Yeah. So they can take the water bottle to school and they can use their mechanical pencils. And there's a bunch of refills in here for them to have more lead for their pencils. So there's all sorts of fun stuff in there. All meant to help children grow. Let's see if I can begin to get this back in its place. Well, we'll try later. It did close when I opened it up. Well, um, when the children, the, the purpose of giving these things to children isn't because they necessarily have to have them, but to let them know that they are loved. And along with each of these boxes, Children are going to receive material that will tell them about Jesus, and they're going to be invited to come back for many days to learn about Jesus and to grow in their faith in Jesus. When God gives us a gift, I, I think when people put things in this box, like the mechanical pencils, they expect the child will use them, right? Maybe for doing schoolwork. Or if they put in some paint that a person would draw, or, or color, or, or, or make a picture, or if they put in a soccer ball, that they'll blow it up and they'll play with it. When people are giving gifts, they're expected in some way that they're going to use them. And our, our Bible story today is, is about gifts that are given. Now, we're given all kinds of gifts. Some, some of us are better at math, and some of us are better at spelling, or some of us are good at playing an instrument or playing soccer or helping other people. But whatever gift we have from God, God gives it to us to help us grow. And so we go to school and we practice sports so that we can grow in our gift. But when Jesus tells a story here today, it was a man who gave gifts to three individuals. He was going on a journey and he gifted three people with vast amounts of money from his business so that they could grow his business. And they got different amounts because people have different abilities. So he gave them what they, he felt they could handle. And he went away and they put them to use. Two did, but one hid his talent, his gift in the ground and, and didn't use it at all. And this story is really about God giving us gifts to help us help others come to know him. And the best gift, what is the best gift that God gives us? He gives us life and, and, and his love. He gives us his love. And we see that love in Jesus, Operation Christmas Child. We, we share gifts of love in these boxes, but it's all for the point of telling people about God's love, the God's love shown to us in Jesus. He's the best gift. And we want to make sure we aren't just giving pens or pencils or soccer balls or dolls. We want to make sure children are hearing about Jesus because everyone needs to know Jesus. 
And the second best gift he gives us is the Bible, where we learn about Jesus. And kids who are getting these gifts are going to come back for Bible stories where they're learning about Jesus, like, just like we do in Sunday school. And the third best gift God gives us, I think, is each other. He gives us families to teach us, teachers to help us learn, friends to play with and help us to know that we're loved. And, and when he gives us all these gifts, gifts of family and gifts of a mind and gifts of a body and sports and gifts of friends, he expects us to use these gifts. He wants us to use these gifts to share his love with everyone in the world. And so that's what we're doing today with Operation Christmas Child. And I'm going to have to work at getting this back in the box. But for now, I'm going to put it away until I can repack it. And, and we're going to have a prayer today for the boxes that people of our congregation have brought. And, and then I, I, when I went shopping for my box, I bought extra supplies um, just so I'd have enough. And I have leftovers, so I'm going to give you some of the gifts that we would have put in our boxes, and you can kind of choose what you'd like to have. But let's have a prayer for these boxes. Can you come over with me and stand up and put your hands on these boxes so you can help me pray for these boxes and for the children who will get them? We pray together. Dear Jesus, use these boxes of love to help children around the world to know your love that we know in Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming up. Now, don't leave yet. I'm going to give you a gift, and then you can help wheel these boxes back. Let's see if I can... Let me just get this off here and over to here, and let me open this bag up so we can see what's in there. I have colored erasable pencils. I have a deck of some decks of cards. I have... Do you want a coloring pencil here? I have some regular pencils, but they're kind of shiny and fancy. I have uh, a notebook to draw in. So everybody can take one of these. Thank you. You're welcome. You can take a couple. Oh, they're gone. Okay. Thanks for bringing those back. And thank you, congregation, for participating in our Operation Christmas Child Shoeboxes, an evangelism effort of our congregation. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. We have so many people thinking in so many ways about the second coming of Christ, how to prepare. I remember a number of years ago, probably in 2000, and 11, that uh, um, one of the radio uh, preachers, his name was Harold Camping, uh, you may remember signs around town, they were actually around the world, billboards, predicting that Jesus would come. It was kind of a countdown billboard, how many days there were left until Jesus would return. And he believed Jesus was coming on May 11th, or May 21st in 2011. And there's so many problems I have with that because Jesus said, of course, he didn't know the day nor the hour. Only the Father did. The angels in heaven don't, but somehow Carol Camping was able to figure out the day or hour. I, I have problems with how that relates to Scripture. Um, but there's a much more practical problem I have. Billboards around the country, around the world, cost a lot of money. And people sold their campers, their homes, 
emptied their bank accounts and sent it in to Harold Camping so that he could buy advertising around the world so that people could be saved and not go to hell, which is, I mean, that's okay. I like that part, but, but then Jesus didn't come right away. And what were they supposed to do after May 21st when they'd sold their homes or emptied their bank accounts? Because the bridegroom was delayed in the first of the two parables. That would have caused two things. A dramatic hardship on people. So unnecessary because Jesus said no one's going to know except for Harold Camping. No, he didn't say that. And, and, and the other hardship is when people find out that they've been following somebody and that somebody has let them down by some false teaching or some immoral act, they become disillusioned in their faith. And many of them would stop going to church, stop reading the Bible, stop connecting to God. And that would have an impact not on their bank account, but their eternal soul. We have in these parables today, parables about the impact of the delay of Christ and what we ought to be doing while we are while we are waiting for Jesus to return. And we don't know when it will be. Jesus says, keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. We, we don't know when it will be. So we heard in parable in stories last week about, well, then we should be ready at all times. And how are we ready at all times? Well, we, we will be found doing the work he gives us to do whether that's caring for our family or for our neighbor, we, we know what we're supposed to be doing. Be busy sharing the love of God with other people in your actions and in your words. That's what we should be doing. That's how we'll be ready for the coming of the day of Christ. Not by figuring out when it's going to happen so I can, at the last minute, get ready. Or I can try and convince a friend with a billboard or somehow to, to come to faith in Christ. I ought to be doing that all the time. Because, as we said last week, we don't know when our last hour will be. Like our friend and our brother in Christ, Larry, who stopped by to get devotional books, and two and a half hours later was in that fatal uh, motorcycle accident. We just don't know when he's coming. We don't know when he's coming or when we're going to go to him. So be ready and be doing the work he's called us to do. That's the way we ought to think. That's what we heard last week. And Jesus is now talking about what what ought we to do. And the first parable, we have ten bridesmaids who are waiting for the groom to come. Five who were wise because they brought extra oil, and five that were foolish because they didn't. They weren't prepared for the delay. Right? What would you do if you didn't have any bank account or any house any longer? What would you do? Well, five were foolish and didn't have the long view. And eventually the bridegroom does come and the foolish have run out of oil and they want to have the wise share some of their oil with them. And it seems almost unkind, doesn't it? When the, when the, the wise who have extra oil, they said, uh, no, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. If they had shared their oil with the foolish, then 10 people wouldn't have had enough oil. They couldn't do that because then they'd miss the bridegroom. And missing the bridegroom in this story is really important because the five who were wise go to greet the bridegroom. The bridegroom came and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Think of the ark. And when the door was shut, there was no way for people to get into the ark. We had that as part of Jesus' teaching on the second coming. And, and uh, then eventually the, the five foolish come and they say, Lord, open to us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I do not know you. There comes a day when he comes again. Now, these bridesmaids were waiting for the bridegroom. 
but they ran out of resources. It seems to me it's a lot like the parable Jesus told in the section on his parables about the people who, like the seeds on the soils, and they get planted among the rocks, and they grow quickly, but the sun comes down and beats them up, and the, they wither and die. They don't have enough root. They don't have enough oil. And another point, so, so that we can, we can grow weary in doing what is good. That's a danger for us as we wait for Christ to come. Just grow weary. What's the point of it all? Well, when we believe that Jesus rose from the dead, I think an incontrovertible fact of history for me. And we believe that he's coming again. And I believe that because in this section, Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. He's coming again. He said so. The one who conquered death is coming for all of us. And we don't know when he's coming. It could be easy sometimes to get tired waiting, especially when we're facing difficulties. So in the New Testament, throughout the time of waiting, Christians are encouraged to take heart and stand steadfast. In our second lesson today, Paul ended the second lesson by saying, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up. It's a section in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians all about the second coming of Christ. And besides Revelation, those are the two other books of the New Testament that are completely about the second coming. And, and, and Paul ended this verse, verse 11, by saying encourage one another. It's a long hard journey, and there are many days where we get discouraged. So we have a job to do. Encourage one another. Now what I can't do, I can encourage one another, but what I can't do is I can't believe for you. Only you can believe. Those who believe are waiting for the bridegroom, and he brings us into the kingdom. But if I'm waiting to think of, will I give my life to Christ? And you keep waiting to think, will I give my life to Christ? There will come a day where you can't wait any longer. Either you have died or he has come. So he says, keep awake. Make sure you're ready. I guess it's what the airline attendant says every time you get on the plane. If your child's with you and the oxygen pops down, they say, do not put it on your child first. Put it on yourself first. And then once you're breathing, you help your child next to you. It seems counterintuitive, but it's the same advice Jesus gives. And what the, the five bridesmaids who are wise say, make sure you're trusting in God and you're hanging on, encourage one another, but you can't believe for another person. So make sure you find faith in God. And then when you have that, encourage one another in this long journey. The second story that Jesus tells in, uh, the, in chapter 25, the second of three parables, and next week we'll get the final parable about the last judgment. The second parable is about the parable of the talents. What was, I began the service by asking, what would you do if you knew the future? It was a fun movie. I watched it again yesterday just to, just to enjoy watching this movie called Frequency about a man who had real, um, a, a real earnestness to talk to his father 30 years earlier. They discovered that they were talking to each other. It's in the movie. You'll see it. But ham radio and a disturbance in the atmosphere allowed them to speak 30 years to each other. It's, of course, all fanciful. But if your father has died almost 30 years ago and you could do something to save his life, wouldn't that be about the most important thing you could do? If you knew the future, if you knew Jim Caviezel, if you knew his father and you're talking to him three days or two days before he's going to die, what would be your most important thing to tell him? Don't do what you did that got you killed. And he was a firefighter, and you'll see the movie if you ever watch it. 
but don't do that. He wanted to save his father's life. And of course, then when you go back in history and you change history, it changes everything. And so it's a movie about all the muddled mess that happens when you change one thing in history and how they have to try and rechange everything that's going on. But he did something else that was fun. He had a best friend, his name was Gordo. These are just kids, they're 11 years old or so. And maybe, maybe eight, eight, 10 years old. And, and his friend, uh, Jim Caviezel's character, he keeps looking at the stock market and said, boy, I should have bought Yahoo. And every day, he's like, boy, I should have bought Yahoo. It just keeps growing. And so he gets on the ham radio and he tells his friend, listen, I have a present for you. And his friend doesn't know it's his friend talking 30 years in the future. But he says, remember a magic word. It's like abracadabra. Remember this word. Okay, what word? Yahoo. <laughs> and at the end of the movie, he has a, a, a Mercedes car with the license plate, number one, Yahoo. Uh, so obviously, he remembered the word. So, uh, so maybe what you'd do if you could predict the future and you know what the lottery numbers are going to be in a week, well, you'd go out and buy the lot lottery ticket, I guess. That's kind of what that Yahoo story was in the line. But that would be taking care of yourself. Do you think that was the number one thing for Jim Caviezel's character to help his friend make a million bucks? It was to save his father's life, right? If you knew the future, what would be the thing you would do? Well, the truth is, we know the future. The master of the household is coming back. And he has gifted us with wealth beyond our comprehension. There's probably people in America who this wealth is not beyond their comprehension, but it is for us. One talent worth an enormous sum. One guy gets five, one gets two, and one gets one. And two use it and double it for the master, not for themselves, right? They're not out to get Yahoo early and, and make a million bucks. They're out to further the belongings of the kingdom. And, and they got five talents or two talents. And when he comes back, they give him back what he gave them plus double. And then there's the guy who just hid it in the ground. And thankfully, no one found it and stole it. Right? He was able to give it back. But, but in the end, Jesus, well, these words of sending a person to hell, cast out the worthless servant into the utter darkness in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He had no love for the master. The first two, they loved the master and they made all they could for the, for the sake of the master. But the third one, what did he have to say about the master? Master, I, I know you to be a hard man. That's not the way the first two thought. That's the way he thinks. Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you do not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. Some people think of God as a hard man. And they're afraid of him or angry at him. But not the first two, they love him. But when you think the master's a hard man, you don't have much love for him. Like a boss, and we've, some of us have had bosses that we, we didn't think very highly of. No love there. We may have done the work they required us to do, but not out of love. This third person has no love for the master. And he ends up going to hell, the place where there is outer darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth. But we know the future. At least that's what we confess as Christian people. So like I said to the children, we take our talents. If my talent is kicking a soccer ball and I do it well enough, then I'm probably gonna have a platform in my, in my junior high group, in my high school group, in my college group, in my pro athletes. I'm probably gonna have a platform if I'm a believer in Christ to use kicking a soccer ball to have an opportunity to tell someone about Jesus. If I love kayaking, I can just go out by myself every day kayaking. Or I could gather a group of people to say, hey, you like kayaking too, why don't we kayak together? And periodically in the group of people have an opportunity to share my faith and grow the talent. 
God gives me me. What if I came back to him and I brought another? I doubled with the gift of faith that he gave me by sharing it with another. Whatever my talents are, we, some of us are helpers and we go into being counselors or pastors or nurses. But obviously, not just pastors, but counselors and nurses have opportunities to share their faith. I meet with David Scheider on a regular basis. He's a psychiatrist son of Jake and Anna Scheider. And he shares his faith with almost every, every client. And he talks about his meeting with Pastor Bob. And periodically people ask him, you still meet with Pastor Bob? He goes, oh yeah, most, most weeks I meet with Pastor Bob. We don't meet every week, but most weeks we get together and support each other in our faith. And he's regularly talking about faith and people reading the scriptures and praying with his clients. That's not your usual view of a psychiatrist, but he's a well-recognized psychiatrist around the world, around the country. He's using his talent to share faith in Jesus Christ. God has gifted you. He wants you to use that so that his kingdom can be expanded. This is what he wants us to do how we ought to think about our actions because we know he is coming again and we want to be ready for him. Amen. Please rise with me as we join in confessing our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Together we confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue with our offertory prayer. And today we receive our <coughs> hunger basket uh, for our, on this third Sunday for world hunger. Lord Jesus, your coming is certain. Help us to remain faithful, doing the work you call us to do while we wait for your return. Lord, the amazing thing in this story of the talents is that you trust us. You believe in us so that you have entrusted us with a wealth of time and talents, abilities, and faith, gifts which are from you and which you have called us to put to work in advancing your kingdom. Receive these regular offerings and our special hunger offering, which we pray may bring you joy and advance your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and all people according to their needs. Father God, your people know neither the day nor the hour of your return, but we, like Christians throughout the ages, pray, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. Until his return, help us, your people, to live boldly in faith. We pray for your people here at Good Hope, in the North American Lutheran Church, the church in Madagascar, Comoros, Meritus, Seychelles, and the church throughout the world. Send your Holy Spirit upon your church and breathe into it new and vibrant life. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Help us to see you for who you really are, a God who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Give hope and bless all who are in worship this day. Teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Bless the grandchildren of the Chapmans as they celebrate those with November birthdays. 
Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord, you clothe us with the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of salvation. Let all who seek your help in their times of trial find deliverance from all that troubles them. We pray for all in need, their families and caregivers, and all who are hospitalized or in special need this week. Ed and Katie, Georgianne and Paul, Don, Tom, Mariella, uh, Ramon, uh, Jeanette, Mike, Linda, Gail, Bill, Steve, John, and all whom we pray for uh, before you silently or aloud at this time. We join all in giving thanks for answering our prayers. Lord, in your mercy. And Heavenly Father, comfort Abby on the death of her father, Larry. Bless Mary Beth as she remembers her mother, Donna, on what would have been her 95th birthday this past week. And bless all who grieve the loss of loved ones. Without you, there would be only darkness and despair. In you, we have a hope for you have destined us for salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And together we will sing the Lord's Prayer in the song, As It Is in Heaven. art in heaven hallowed be thy name our father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and all the power and the glory Receive the benediction. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Sing praise to the Father. Sing praise to the Son, sing praise to the Spirit, our God three in one, the Father Creator, the Son who redeems the Spirit.
Spirit who blesses our thoughts, hopes, and dreams. Praise, adoration, thanksgiving, and love. We lift up to you in your heaven above. Be with us in worship. Please hear as we pray. call to mission. God calls the people of Good Hope Lutheran Church to be his disciples, to proclaim Jesus Christ as the focus of life, and to share his hope and love with all. And let us go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thank, Thank you, you, God, God for, for everything. everything.
to face the day In your presence All our fears are washed away It's when we see you All our fears are washed away In your presence All our fears are washed away Washed away
morning. Good morning. And the Lord be with you. And also with you. I want to welcome everyone uh, watching it online and everyone in person to worship today. I invite you to let us know you're worshiping with us by signing the attendance page. I want to thank everyone for uh, the participation in the Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes. As people were just coming in, we finally collected the last couple of boxes and we hit our goal of 81 shoe boxes for this year. That's wonderful. We're still collecting toys from the Toys for Tots collection box that's down by the doors at the entryway. Um, if you guys want to bring those uh, up now, we can, we can pause and have a prayer uh, for the boxes and then I'll do the rest of the announcements. I don't know if they got them all on there, or if there's a few in the back, or maybe they got all 81 boxes on there, but what a gift. And you guys can help me at this service. We're going to uh, lay our hands on these boxes and ask a blessing on these boxes. So, dear Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for every person who's uh, had the joy of filling these shoe boxes with gifts of love. We give you thanks for the children that you are going to direct these gifts to. And Lord, in, in your knowledge, in, in your amazing knowledge, you know which of these boxes are already going to end up in a particular child's hand. As they open their box, uh, may they experience our love, but be introduced, Lord, through these boxes and the material that comes along with it. Uh, in the Bible studies that they'll do for days, may they be introduced to the, the King of love, to our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave his life for them, that they might know a peace that passes understanding. Bless each person who's filled boxes, and especially, Lord, bless the children and their families who receive the boxes along with the word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for bringing these up. Then also due today are our Christmas poinsettia orders. Uh, there are still some pink slips, and if you have your checkbook or cash, you can put it in today. But if perchance not, and you, you forgot, you can call the church office in the morning, and we'd be glad to. No, you can't. No one will be in the church office on Monday morning. Uh, our staff is going to be down at Camp Frederick decorating for Christmas. But you can call Monday afternoon or Tuesday morning, and then um, you can uh, uh, fill in the, uh, uh, we'll fill in the information, you can mail a check in. Council members are asked to pick up their church council packets following worship today. Uh, in the gathering room, we have a number of DVDs on some shelves that are just like loners. Uh, faith uh, stories, faith DVDs, you can pick up, take home, and bring back so others can have it. We periodically have some that go missing. People just forget to return them. But we had a new edition this week, The Jesus Revolution. And so that's there for people to check out and return uh, back to the church. And if you have any old DVDs you're not using very often, you wish to share that are faith-based faith DVDs, we invite you to bring them to the church and put them in the loner uh, pile uh, that are on the shelves. I noticed uh, this last week, uh, early in the week, uh, something I, I, I just hadn't been aware of, and I won't go into the details of how, but, but I realized on Monday that over the last four years, we've had 41 church member funerals. I've done more than that because I've done the brother of or the uncle of or the grandson of funeral, but, but we've had 41 of our church members pass away, which is a significant portion of, of our congregation. And during that same four-year period of time, much of that time, we all faced separation from the restrictions due to COVID uh, precautions. And so I just thought, we got to spend more time together. And we do that here in worship, but not this week, but the week after Thanksgiving. Starting anything on the day before Thanksgiving is crazy, so we're not going to do that. But on the Wednesday after Thanksgiving, we're going to just open up the the uh, uh, gathering room, put the coffee on, and invite anyone who'd like to just gather and have coffee with another church member, or bring a friend, um, and, and we can have conversation as a large group, we can break into little groups, come and have 
a cup of coffee, meet your friend here. Uh, just, I think it'd be great for us to have some fellowship time, a good response to getting back together and, and cherishing one another. We're going to have a note in the newsletter about that, and I will announce it next Sunday so that we remember to come, if, if you're able, if you want, uh, at uh, 10 o'clock in the morning on, on Wednesdays. We'll have a, a short little prayer, and then just spend some time enjoying each other's company. Final announcement is that I wanted to remind you to, this morning that Mike Summers is not here because he's on a plane flying to New York uh, for the Thanksgiving, Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. He's one of about 400, a little over 400 band directors from across America and several in our area that have been invited because of their excellence to participate in the Band Directors Association of America in their parade uh, at uh, Macy's. And so if you want to see Mike marching and that wonderful band made up of band directors, uh, they're early in the parade. I believe that uh, Channel 27 will be starting their coverage at 8.30, and they are the first group, fourth group up. Alabama A&M is the first band, first group, first band, and then the NYPD group will be coming through. I'm sure bagpipes will be there. And then the... Uh, Radio City Music Hall Rockettes will be coming through. And right after the Rockettes, we get the band directors. And I've heard that the, the balloon Snoopy will be near them. So I, you wouldn't have to be on at 8.30, but you'd probably need to be on by 8.45 or before. So if you want to see Mike support him, uh, feel free to do that. And also, of course, I want to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving this week. We come to our call to mission not, excuse me, to our uh, call to worship. And today is the third week of Jesus's fifth teaching, fifth great teaching in the Gospel of Matthew that we are focused on. It's, it covers the topics of the second coming, the final judgment, and how we ought to live in the light of his coming again. Week one, Jesus shared the signs of his coming. Last week, he talked about the impact on, on our thinking as we prepare for his return. And today we consider the impact on our actions. I remember a movie this week, I was thinking as I prepared for this service and these uh, readings in Matthew 25, I thought about a movie I'd seen many years ago, thought once, but it was about, it was called, um, I had to look it up. It was called Frequency. One of the people in the movie was Jim Caviezel. And he was playing in our current day, a New York City police detective. And he found his father's old ham radio, and there was an atmosphere, of course this wouldn't work, but it was sci-fi. But there was an atmospheric disturbance, and when he turned on his father's ham radio, he could, he could speak to his father from 30 years before. And his father and him are having a conversation. At that time, 30 years before, he was a young boy, I don't know, 10 or 11 years old. But, but he's, he's talking to his father, and what's really important is that his father, he knew his father was going to die two days later. You know, he, his father was a, fire, a fireman in New York, and he was going to die in a fire. Now, you, you can understand, there's some angst on... Jim Caviezel's character on his part to get his father to not do whatever he did that caused his death 30 years earlier. And, and so that, that got me to thinking, if you knew what was going to happen in the future, what would you do? In the case of Jim Caviezel, it's really understandable. I lost my father when I was 11 years old. I, if I could do anything, if I knew the future, I would stop that from happening, right? That makes sense. But if you knew the future, right now, if you knew the future, what would you do? That's a question that I think uh, we address, or Jesus addresses, as we enter into uh, the gospel lessons today. Those are all the announcements and the call to worship. So we continue with our brief order of confession and forgiveness. Our organist is back, and I can go to the back of the sanctuary. Please rise and face the baptismal font for our, con our uh, confession and forgiveness.
we gather in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In 1 John chapter 1, God's word says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We pause for a short moment of personal reflection and confession. And together, most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed <clears throat> by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his only son to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may face forward as we join in singing our opening song, Rejoice, Rejoice, Believers, hymn 244.
Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, Lamb of God, Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, who take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Let us pray. Gracious God, in baptism, you pour out upon us gifts of immeasurable eternal worth, faith, salvation, and the calling to serve as your witnesses in the world. Help us to deepen our baptismal life, walking wet daily and responding with abandon to your gracious gifts. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading today comes from Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 7 through 16. Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guests. And on the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the officials and the king's sons and all who array themselves in foreign attire. On that day, I will punish everyone who leaps over the threshold and those who fill their master's house with violence and fraud. On that day, declares the Lord, a cry will be heard from the fish gate, a wail from the second quarter, a loud crash from the hills. Wail, O inhabitants of the mortar, for all the traitors are no more. All who weigh out silver are cut off. At that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men who are complacent. Those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. Their goods shall be plundered, and their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, 
They shall not drink wine from them. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will now read responsively Psalm 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, forever you had formed the earth and the world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, Return, O children of man. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, for as watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are seventy, or even by reason of strength eighty. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days that we may get heart of wisdom. Our second reading is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them, as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. The word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Please rise. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. We begin at verse number one. Jesus said, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins, who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. 
And the foolish said to the wise, give, me, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. For it will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went out, went at once and traded with them and made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid the master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. When he had received the five talents, uh, came forward, bringing the five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had made two talents more, um, Excuse me. And he also who had the two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I scattered, I, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you do not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast that worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, the Christ. Amen. Back about 12 years ago, in early May or maybe maybe uh, March, there began to appear uh, billboards around the Mahoning Valley talking about the end of the world. Harold Camping was a radio preacher who had, in his study of the Bible, determined the day that Jesus was coming. And that date was going to be all these billboards were doing a, a countdown uh, of how many days were left. He said it was going, Jesus was coming back on May 21st, 2011. He was wrong, of course. And then he recalculated quickly and said, no, it's going to be October 21st, 2011. And so the billboards went up again. Um, it, it's always amazing to me, and he's not the first. He probably won't be the last. Uh, who at different times in the world's history have determined 
that Jesus was going to come on a particular day and crowds would go sit out on hills waiting for Jesus to come, that doesn't bother me. But the billboards bother me because there were, for at least a couple of reasons, there were followers of Carol Camping who actually sold their homes and emptied their bank accounts and sent the money in so that these billboards could be paid for around the world. You could look it up and see them in different languages. It took a significant amount of money to do that. And so what happens on May 22nd when you've sold your home or you've emptied your bank account? How are you going to wait? How are you going to live until Jesus finally does come? But even worse than the impact he had on some families about their financial well-being was that what happens when preachers like that predict something and it doesn't happen, people begin to lose faith. And, and the really bad thing is, is when they feel swindled and now they have no, nothing to live on and they begin to despair. And some people will when that happens. If, if they have a preacher they love and follow and he disappoints them, either in his teaching or in his moral character, some people will stop going to church and stop praying and stop believing because it's like the wind got blowing out of their sails. And that would be really sad. Jesus, Harold Camping knew what Jesus didn't, right? We, we heard it two weeks ago. Uh, not even the Son of Man nor the angels. Only the Father in heaven knows the day that Jesus is going to to return. Well, Jesus was obviously wrong. Harold Camping knew the day. <laughs> well, Jesus wasn't wrong. He also promised us that heaven and earth will pass away. He'd just given all the, the signs of the coming kingdom, and he ended by saying, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. He is coming, but at a day nor hour that he does not know, and no one else except the Father knows that day or hour. So because we know and believe that he is coming, and there has been already a 2,000-year delay, the, the early apostles thought he was coming any time. Martin Luther thought he was coming in his day. Christians throughout the centuries have, have longed for the coming of Jesus. I long to meet Jesus. Whether he comes tomorrow or I die in 10 years, I'm going to see Jesus, and I can't wait for that day. But what do we do while we wait in the long waiting that the church has known these 2,000 years? Well, Jesus gave us some concepts about how to wait in our thinking last week. He said, obviously, if you don't know when he's coming in the parables and stories of last Sunday, well, then be ready all the time. Then you don't have to worry what hour the, the thief is coming or what hour the master is coming home. Just be ready. And then secondly, do the work God has called you to do. Be ready. And when the master comes, let him see that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. And if that's going home and cooking dinner for your family, then do that. If it's taking up uh, a, a, a casserole dish over to your neighbor because they've just been in the hospital and it'd be a loving, kind thing to show Christian love to your neighbor and take them a hot dish, then do that. Do whatever you're supposed to be doing to show love. If you're a teacher, teach. And if you're a preacher, preach. And if you're a policeman, then police. And, but do those things as a Christian person. The second parable we have today is about the talents that God gives. And of course, those aren't abilities, but they're amazing gifts. A one talent alone would be a, a wealth that none of us have ever known. And, and to be given five talents or two talents, it, it, there may be some people in the world and in America who would understand that kind of money, but, but not us. Um, he gives these overwhelming gifts. And our gifts come as time as relationships, each other is a gift. Um, 
And they come as abilities to teach or to preach or to, or to be a policeman or a nurse. And whatever we're doing, whether it's cooking a dinner or whether we're at work or we're gathered with our retired friends, we're in that place. We are a presence of Christ. And we're sharing the love of Christ in word and deed. We're doing the work we're called to do. That was last week. This week continues with two more parables. And the impact is on our actions. The bridegroom is delayed. There are 10 uh, women who are waiting for the bridegroom. They've brought their oil lamps. Five are foolish and five are wise. The wise brought extra oil with them and the unwise didn't bring any extra oil. They thought he'd come right away. And it's been a problem for Christians when there's a delay, like the people who sold their houses or cashed in their bank accounts. Well, what do you do tomorrow if he hasn't come? Well, that's a problem. If you run out of oil, how will you live until the day he finally comes? Don't be unwise, but wise, Jesus says. And there's something in the story that sounds kind of harsh at first. When they hear the cry that the bridegroom has come, they all get up and trim their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, no, there will not be enough for you and us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourself. If they had shared their oil, they'd have all run out of oil before they finally got to the wedding banquet. They couldn't do that. There are some things in life where we have to, like the airline attendant says, take care of ourselves first. The, the oxygen mask comes down and your child is there. And they have to tell you every time you go on a plane, you hear the same thing. If the mask comes down, put yours on before you take care of your child. That is so counterintuitive. But they tell us we have to do that. We have to take care of ourselves so that then I'm able to breathe and take care of my child. Your faith cannot be passed on. Well, it can be caught by another, but you can't take your faith and give it to your child. They have to have faith of their own. Right? You can't pass that on. You can share your faith. And hopefully through the power of the Holy Spirit, they will come to faith. But you can't believe for another person. You can only believe for yourself. Make sure when Jesus comes, you are one of those believers. And don't let the length discourage you. Jesus told a parable. We had it earlier, this parable of the sower and the seeds. And some seed fell on the rocky ground. The, 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 the plant grew up quickly, but it had no depth of soil because it was in rocky ground. The sun came and scorched it, and it withered quickly away. Believer for a while and then not a believer. Jesus is coming. Of that, we are certain. At least I am. I am certain he rose from the dead. I think, personally, it's an incontrovertible historical fact. That's what I believe. And I believe what he said. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. I am coming back for you. I believe there will be a final judgment. But I don't know when it will be. And I can't just have a little pile of oil, of faith. That needs to be nurtured. Uh, so I keep coming to worship. And I keep praying. And I keep gathering or having coffee with other Christians. Because we're here to encourage one another. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians, and other than the book of Revelation, the only other two books in the New Testament that are completely about the second coming are First and Second Thessalonians. And here at verse 11 of our reading today, Paul says, in light of Jesus' return, therefore encourage one another and build one another up. This is a long journey. I talked to someone at, at the table having coffee between services, and they'd been on a hike with a friend of theirs who had brought way too much. A chair. All sorts of things. And... and into the journey, this person was getting overwhelmed. So one friend took the chair, another person took other things and put it in their pack to help lighten the burden. 
Some of us are carrying more than we need to, and sometimes it's not our fault. And then we're sent to encourage each other, to carry the burden for each other, to help each other make it until Jesus comes again. We need to gather together for coffee, for worship, certainly, for the Lord's Supper, that we can be nurtured and, and, and we'll have enough oil to make it till the end. It's a long journey. I don't know when he's coming. But if I daily am in his word and daily in prayer and weekly in worship and I gather with you, well, then I think I'll find the strength and you'll help me find the strength to make it till the end. Keep awake, Jesus ends the parable with, for you do not know either the day nor the hour. So prepare for the long haul. Have your faith and don't let it run dry. Coming to worship, praying, reading the word, gathering together for coffee. These are the things that will nurture us for the long journey. Then the second parable, the parable of the talents. Five, two, and one, each given to their ability. And their text says, now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Next week is the story of the final judgment. So that's the settling of accounts. We'll have that story next week. But it's a similar parable. He's gone a very long time. And he comes back. And then the because these servants are stewards of his money, um, his investment in them of his property, they want to show what they've done with that investment, how they've furthered the account of the, of the master, helped build his business. And the first one comes in and said, you gave me five, I made five more. The second one comes in, you gave me two, I made two more. And to each of them, he says exactly the same thing. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. <laughs> For the master, this vast amount of gift is just a teeny little drop. God gives gifts to people. And then we return our gifts. We give our offerings to God. Not because God needs any money. <laughs> He's not running low on his bank account. He owns everything even your house and what's in your bank account, it all belongs to God. He's not in need of any help from any of us. But he wants us to be investing what he has given to us to further his kingdom. And the two come in and say, you gave us five, you gave us two, and here I've made you two more, I've made you five more. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little, I will set you over much. I wonder what that is. Enter into the joy of your master. What would cause a person to take that huge amount and not just sit back saying, wow, he's gone on a long trip. I could take a little vacation to begin with. <laughs> they got to work right away. But not the third guy. He was afraid. Here's what he said of the master. He, he presented himself to the master. He who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed, so I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. He's lucky someone didn't find that treasure and steal it. Why, why didn't he do something useful? Well, we're told he was afraid. The first two weren't afraid of the master. Why did he work that hard? Because they loved him. You've all had bosses you've worked for, whether it was in, when you were a child or, or as an adult. You've all had people you worked for who you put in a fair day's work because you had to. But there was no joy in the serving. And then there's people who were such good bosses that you didn't mind going the extra mile. He had a view of the master that the first two didn't. They loved the master and they loved what the master was doing and they, they wanted to use what they'd been given to further the master's work. 
The final one, he didn't love the master. He was afraid of him. And so he just buried the treasure. Didn't do anything with the gift that was given to him. And what does Jesus say to him? Well, first, take away his talent and give it to the one who has ten. And cast that worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hell, that's Matthew's description, or Jesus' description in Matthew of hell. Throw that servant to hell. Remember, in many of his parables, the wheat and the weeds have been mixed together. He has servants who are going to go to heaven, and he has servants who are going to go to hell. People who he's preached the kingdom to. Is the person going to hell because they hid the, ser- the they were afraid and hid the, ser- the, the treasure in the field? No, but because they hated the master. And they did not love him. They weren't in a relationship with the master. They were just there for the show. Maybe it was a job. God calls us to be his servants. Who respond to this. It's kind of like the boxes we prayed for. These gifts of love are supposed to be simply a vehicle that can capture a child's attention. And they come to hear the word about Jesus who gives us the best gift. We think of all the gifts we have and, and how, do, how do we live with those gifts? Well, the best gift is Jesus and the gift of salvation that he gives to us, the forgiveness of sins, peace, eternal life. The, the, the second gift is the Bible by which we know The second greatest gift for me is the Bible by which we come to know Jesus and know him and hear him speaking to us daily. And the third gift is the gift of each other where we can give a casserole when needed or we can just have a cup of coffee together because we can be there to support each other in this journey. He gives us wondrous gifts and he calls on us to use those gifts. I began the service by talking about that Jim Caviezel movie, uh, Frequency. And and in the movie, Jim is talking to his father 30 years earlier, sci-fi movie. But he also gets to talk to his best friend, Gordo, who's about 11 years old. And and in the movie early on, we see Jim Caviezel and his best friend as adults uh, interacting 30 years later. And and a couple of times, uh, Gordo is saying... I should have bought Yahoo earlier. It's up five more points today. So in the movie, Gordo had said that often enough that at one point, his father is on the radio, he's on the radio 30 years later, and Gordo comes into the room. And so his father puts Gordo on the, on the phone, and he doesn't try, or on the ham radio, doesn't try and tell him about the 30 years, but he says, hey, I'm like Santa Claus. My name is John, but I'm like Santa Claus. I'm going to give you a secret word like abracadabra, and I want this secret word. I don't want you to ever forget this, this secret word. <gasps> What's the word? Yahoo. Repeat it back. Yahoo. Can you remember that? Yahoo. And then at the end of the story, it pans out to a ball field where people are hitting balls, and one goes into the headlight of a, of a Mercedes-Benz, and the license plate, and it's Gordo's car, and the license plate says, number one, Yahoo. <laughs> he obviously remembered and bought stocks and made a million dollars. Well, what would you do if you knew the future? Would you help your friend get a million bucks? I get, I, you know, Maybe. But that wasn't what the movie was about. That was just a funny little story in the movie. The movie was about how he could convince his father that he was, I'm your son, 30 years down the road, and you're going to die in two days. And what can we do to prevent you from dying in two days? If you could tell the future, what would you do? By the lottery numbers, would that be the best thing to do? What would be the most important thing you could do if you knew the future? Well, Jim Caviezel figured, save my father's life. And Jesus knows the future. And in the future is the final judgment. And what's the best thing he could do? Give his life 
so that every person in the world who believes can be saved. And the best thing we can do, because we know he's coming, is you can join in him in that work which he gifts you to do so that others can be saved and not spend eternity in the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is how his second coming is meant to impact our actions. At this time we sing our hymn of the day, God who's giving knows no ending, hymn 678. And together we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This is the third Sunday of the month, and we have also received our, our hunger offering as well as our regular offering. Lord Jesus, your coming is certain. Help us to remain faithful as we wait for your return. You believe in us so much that you have entrusted us with a wealth of time, abilities, and gifts, and relationships from you, which you have called us to put to work in advancing your kingdom. Today, Lord, receive these regular and hunger offerings, which we bring to you in joy and love and faith, and use these, Lord, to build your kingdom now. In the name of Christ, we pray. 
Amen. And let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and all people according to their needs. Father God, you, your people know neither the day nor the hour of your return, but we, like Christians throughout the ages, pray, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. Until his return, help your people to live boldly in faith. We pray for your people at Good Hope in the North American Lutheran Church, the church in Madagascar, Comoros, Mauritius, Seychelles, and the church throughout the world. Send your Holy Spirit upon the church and breathe into it new life. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Help us to see you for who you are, a God who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and who showers us with the wealth of your provision. Give hope and bless all who worship this day. Teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Bless the grandchildren of the Chapmans as they celebrate those with November birthdays. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord, you clothe us with the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of salvation. Let all who seek your help in their time of trial find deliverance from all that troubles them. We pray for all in need, their families and caregivers and all who are hospitalized or in special need this week, Miriam, Dick, Ed, Katie, Georgian, Paul, Don, Tom, Mariella, Jeanette, Mike, Linda, Phyllis, uh, Gail, Bill and Simon, er, Bill and Bob and Steve, and all whom we name before you silently or aloud at this time. We join all in giving thanks for answering our prayers. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, comfort Abby on the death of her father, Larry, and John on the death of his father. Bless Mary Beth as she remembers her mother, Donna, on what would have been her 95th birthday this past week. And bless all who grieve the loss of loved ones. Without you, there would be only darkness and despair. In you, we have hope, for you have destined us for salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And together this week, we sing the Lord's Prayer. Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Receive the benediction. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We sing our closing song, a great uh, entrance into thanksgiving hymn for the fruit of all creation. to mission. God calls the people of Good Hope Lutheran Church to be his disciples, to proclaim Jesus Christ as the focus of life, and to share his hope and love with all. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. And we sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures Charlotte.